In the last video, we discussed the four main perspectives on the millennium. As promised, we are now going to take two of those perspectives, premillennialism and all millennialism, and we're going to explore them in much more detail. In this video, we will look at all millennialism, which suggests that Christ came, died, resurrected, established his church, and that the entirety of the church age is the millennial reign of Christ. It will end after a period of tribulation with the second coming of Jesus Christ and the last judgment and the beginning of, of the new heavens, the new earth, the beginning of eternity. And in the next video, we will look at premillennialism in as much detail. Before we look at it line by line, let's go ahead and read the text, and I'm just going to give some commentary as we go. And remember that Revelation originally does not have chapters and verses. So, you know, when one chapter ends and another one begins, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to us. But where we're going to pick it up is right there toward the end of chapter 19, where you're having the second coming of Christ, uh, the battle of Armageddon, and the beast and the false prophet are being dealt with. It says, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So uh, uh, that, according to the all-millennial perspective, is the end of the second coming. At this point, uh, John stops narrating the second coming, and he's going to jump all the way back to the first coming of Christ with this next verse, with verse 1. And I saw, so this is a new vision according to the all millennialists, and I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That is, according to the all millennialist, bound him for the entirety of the church age. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Right? So Satan is bound for a thousand years, which is the entire church age. And during that time, he is not allowed to deceive the nations, right? So right now, according to all millennialism, uh, this is in effect. Satan, in some sense, we'll discuss it in more detail, in some sense, is locked in the abyss right now, not able to deceive the nations. And in verse 4, John begins to describe the reign of the church during the thousand years that represents the church age. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And judgment was given to them, and the souls of the ones who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So those who were martyred, or potentially all Christians, we'll talk about that, there's a debate there, but either just the martyred uh, Christians or all Christians, uh, when they die, they come to life with Christ in heaven and reign with him right now, now during this period of the millennium. And then it says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. That is, the wicked dead and possibly some other people do not come to life until after the end of the church age. The martyrs of Christ and possibly all the righteous come to life immediately after they die and reign with Christ right now in heaven as part of the millennium. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. So this is the end of the church age and the beginning of the Battle of Armageddon. Satan is being released at the end of the church age uh, in order to go out and start the last battle. Verse 8, And he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. 
And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So uh, that is, they tried to wipe out the church at the end of the church age, uh, but God intervened with the second coming. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beast and the false prophet. Now, you notice I have that highlighted in black. That is literally what it says in Greek, where also the beast and the false prophet. That's all it says. So how you interpret this is going to be based on whether or not you have an all-millennialist approach or a premillennialist approach. If you're an all-millennialist, you think that the beast and the false prophet get thrown into the lake of fire at the same time that Satan does. All right, we'll talk about that in more detail later. So the way you're going to read this, if you're an all-millennialist, you're going to say the devil was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beast and the false prophet will be thrown with him. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Uh, so now we're discussing the final judgment that takes place right after the battle of Armageddon. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which are in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their works. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so all of these things, according to the all millennialists, take place at the time of the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ brings the millennium to a close. You have a final judgment and then eternity begins. And so now what we want to do is we want to go through this and look at it in more detail. According to the all millennialist, at the end of chapter 19, we are looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then John says, and I saw, and this marks a new vision where he has left the second coming of Jesus Christ and gone back to the first coming, gone back to what happened to Satan when Jesus showed up the first time. Just read this short part very quickly again uh, to, to help you understand. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the end of the second coming. And I saw, new vision an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Uh, now we've gone all the way back to the first coming, according to all millennialism. And there's obviously a huge debate here over the power of this phrase, and I saw, ke ethon in Greek. Uh, does it indicate sequence, or does it indicate, as all millennialists say, uh, a different sequence that we've backed way up in the timeline? If I were to say to you, I saw the light turn red, and I saw a man stop at the red light, and I saw the light turn green, and I saw the man drive away, that would indicate sequence. And premillennialists read it this way, that we see the beast and the false prophet dealt with, then we saw their army dealt with, and I saw Satan get dealt with. But the all-millennialist does not read it that way. They think that we've gone back to the first coming of Christ here. And one of the lines of evidence that they use is to point out, even in the immediate context, the phrase, and I saw, can indicate that we are going to an earlier point in the narrative. I'll give you an example from chapter 19 itself. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. So clearly in this passage, the final battle has begun. Judgment is underway. Christ is defeating his enemies. Then look at what it says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse. So we saw the battle narrated. John says, and I saw, 
and then we move back before the battle when they're just gathering for the battle. So an all millennialist is going to point out to you, they're going to say, look here in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, the, we, the phrase, and I saw, takes us to an earlier point in the story. And so when we get to Revelation chapter 20, and John says, and I saw an angel coming down with a chain to bind Satan, uh, this can mean we have left the second battle of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we've gone all the way back to the first coming. Now, this is one of the, uh, all millennialism has some strong points, it has some weak points. This is one of, one of its weak points. This is one of the places where people are not persuaded, that you get a phrase like, and I saw, and it indicates such a shift in focus on, on the timing of the story that we've left the second coming all at once and gone all the way back before the church age to the first coming of Jesus Christ. But this is what the all millennialist will suggest, and this is one of his uh, most difficult points to sell. It's interesting what happens here. If you're an all millennialist, you're reading this, an angel comes down at the beginning of the millennium, at the beginning of the church age, and he takes a chain, he seizes the devil, he binds him with it, he throws him in the abyss, and he seals the abyss over him so that he cannot escape. Now, many critics look at all millennialism and they say, how can you possibly think that Satan is bound right now? Doesn't Paul say that the devil is presently roaming about like a lion seeking whom he may devour? How can he possibly be thought of as being enchained and, and sealed away in the abyss right now? Well, what an all millennialist is going to say is that this is not literal. It's not that Satan is literally locked away in the abyss. It's just that rather that this is a, a symbolic vision letting us know that in some fashion, Satan's power and influence has been mitigated now that the Messiah has come and the church age has been established. And there are a number of passages that they would use to make this point. For example, in 1 John chapter 3, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So there we can see in the first coming of Christ, a significant defeat was uh, dished out against the devil. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Very strong language of judgment there being used against Satan in relationship to the first coming of Christ. Colossians 2.15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So there are a number of passages that indicate that Satan has uh, suffered some serious defeat at the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now, an all millennialist will especially use this passage because in this passage, Jesus uh, is talking about the defeat that he has leveled against the devil. And he specifically states that the devil has been uh, binded at the first coming of Christ. He says, and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. And in context here, Jesus is explaining his ministry. Why is he casting out demons? What does that mean? Well, it's because he has binded up the strong man. He has binded the devil. And so if you're an all millennialist, you're going to read Mark's gospel and say, well, look here. Language is used by Jesus to indicate that Satan has uh, been bound at the first coming of Christ. So in Revelation 20, when the angel uh, binds up the devil, well, then that can be the first coming of Christ too. And thus the millennium is established at the beginning of the church age. So what does it mean that Satan is presently bound up in the abyss? Well, an all millennialist is going to tell you that the devil's powers of deceit have currently been mitigated. Not that they are completely gone, but that they have been mitigated by the arrival of Jesus and the gospel. As it says in Acts 26, the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, and he's talking to Paul, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In Hebrews chapter 2, he himself likewise also partook of the same flesh and blood, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So here in Acts 26, the Gentiles are under the unmitigated control of the devil. They're under his power. And then God sends out the apostles. Jesus sends out the apostles. And it is their job to remove the Gentiles from being under the power of Satan to being under the power of the Son of God. And in Hebrews, the devil has power over death until Jesus dies. And then uh, now the devil doesn't have absolute power over death. Now that there is hope for eternal life. In these senses, the power of the devil has been mitigated by the first coming of Jesus Christ. Also, uh, it indicates that his power has been restrained to end history prematurely. If Satan is able to end history prematurely, the gospel may not reach everyone it is supposed to. Uh, Jesus said that the gospel is for every people group. Well, uh, if, if the gospel has to be on the earth long enough to reach every people group, then Satan's power has to be restrained. That is, he's, he's not allowed to cause the final battle. He's not allowed to launch the final rebellion. So the nations were under the power of Satan, and now the gospel is bringing some of the people out from among the nations to be under the authority of the Son of God. He had power over death. He has power over death no longer, and his power has been restricted so that he cannot end history prematurely by launching the final rebellion. So for an all-millennialist, it's not that Satan is totally gone or that he can't harm anybody at all. It's just that his power has been restrained in all of these senses. Who comes to life for the thousand years to reign with Christ? And if you're an all-millennialist, you think this reign is taking place right now. This is the thousand-year reign uh, is the church age. Is it just the martyrs of Christ? Or is it the entire church? Now, this is a discussion you have to have whether you're an all-millennialist or a premillennialist. You have to uh, try to figure out, does every Christian get to participate in this, or is it just the martyrs? Now, you look here at the text, and you can see why so many people believe that it's just the martyrs who get to participate in the thousand-year reign of Christ. John is going to describe who, who has the authority. He says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And then the highlighted part is the description of these people who have authority. And the souls of the ones who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, right? And then it will tell you that the rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years. And so when you look at this, it clearly states that these are those who have been beheaded because of their testimony. And this leads a great many people to go, well, this is just the martyrs. We're not looking at the entire church here. Only the martyrs of Christ participate in the millennial reign. Now, that's one view. Uh, the other view says that we have two groups of people here, the martyrs plus the general church. So, so according to this view, uh, John is describing two groups. He says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. The first group, the souls of the ones who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And then when he says, and those... For many folks, this is going to mark a second group of Christians who participate in the millennium and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And thus here you have it, two groups. You have the martyrs, they're uh, mentioned especially, but then the rest of the Christians who maybe they didn't give their lives for Christ, but they also did not compromise for Christ. Uh, and both of these groups get to participate in the millennium. And so we're just going to keep both of these perspectives in mind as we go. I personally think that we're just talking about the martyrs here. I don't think 
the whole church participates, but there are a lot of people who disagree with me. And so I just want you to keep both options on the table of your mind uh, as we move forward. Now, it could be that both the martyrs and the general Christian participate in the thousand year reign of Christ. But I want to give you some reasons why it's probably just the martyrs, why I think that is likely the right choice, whether you go with all millennialism or premillennialism. Most likely it's just the martyrs. And here are some of the reasons. Uh, in Revelation 20, it says that you, they have been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And then the question is, do we have a second group here when it says in those who had not worshipped the beast or his image? Well, go back to Revelation 13, and that's the exact description of the martyrs, where it says, and it, that is the second beast who rose from the land, was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast who had risen from the sea, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So in Revelation 20, when it says those who had not worshipped the image of the beast, you should assume that we're still talking about the martyrs because the martyrs have already been described with that exact language back in chapter 13. Uh, so if the martyrs are elsewhere identified as those who would not worship the beast, uh, this is likely not a second group. Uh, this is one group here being discussed in chapter 13, and so it's one group in chapter 20. It's the martyrs. Now, some folks are going to say, yes, John is only looking at the martyrs of Christ. However, uh, the rest of the church is still there. They're still reigning with the martyrs. And they're going to say John's point is that the conquering church will reign with Christ during the millennium. Now, he only talks about the martyrs of Christ because they are the best example of the conquering church, but not because they are necessarily the only ones who reign. Now, this is a possibility. And those who subscribe to this view say, look, you can't take the language of the chapter really literal uh, because then you're going to have to be very restrictive. It doesn't say martyrs of every fold were sitting on the throne, only those who were beheaded. So if you're going to be very strict and very restrictive in the way you see John's language, then that means Christians who died for Christ by drowning or by strangling or were burnt at the stake, etc. they're not there. It's only beheaded Christians. Well, no one is going to do that. They're going to say the beheaded Christians are representative of all Christian martyrs. All right, Beheading is just one example of how Christians get martyred. And if the beheaded Christians in this passage can be representative of all Christian martyrs, then maybe ultimately they are representative of all the conquering saints uh, participating in the millennium. There are some really smart people who are going to go for this. and They're going to say, you have the conquering church here. It's just beheaded Christians are singled out. It's just one very good example of, of the conquering church. And if you go with this, then that means all Christians reign during the millennium. I don't necessarily buy this, but it is a possibility. I think that we're just talking about Christian martyrs here. The beheaded Christians represent all Christian martyrs. I don't think it... Uh, necessarily represents all of the saints. And the reason for that is the martyrs have been distinguished from the larger general church at many points throughout this book. And I'll just very quickly go through this. In Revelation chapter 7, the martyrs are counted out of the sons of Israel. Uh, if you did not watch the video on the 144,000 back in Revelation 7, I recommend you do so. And we demonstrated through many strains of evidence that the martyrs uh, are the 144,000 of the sons of Israel. And so you have all the Christians, all the church has been grafted into Israel. But out of the sons of Israel, the martyrs were counted off as the 144,000. In Revelation 12, the martyrs are specifically highlighted because they overcame the devil and did not love this life enough to shrink from death. In chapter 14, only the 144,000 martyrs were permitted to learn the new song. At the end of that chapter, the larger church is also doing music, but there's no indication that the general church got to learn the special song uh, that the 144,000 got to learn at the beginning of that chapter. Also, and this is very important, uh, the 
harvesting of the righteous at the end of the age in chapter 14 took place in two stages. The 144,000 were the first fruits, that's the martyrs, and then after that, the wheat field was the general harvest came. That was the rest of the church. So if we've already seen that the martyrs are harvested before the rest of the church, what makes sense when you get to Revelation 20, and the martyrs are described as being resurrected before everybody else. And then again in Revelation 21, the city will represent the church in eternity, but the wall around it represents the martyrs in particular. The city will be 12,000 stadia. Uh, 12 is the number of God's people, but the wall around the city is described as being 144 cubits, and the 144 is the number of the martyrs. And so, yes, they are part of the larger city, but they are specifically honored and remembered as being its wall. And so you find a number of places where the martyrs are specifically distinguished from the church because John wants to tell you, do not shrink from your death, do not shrink from martyrdom. Uh, it's the martyrs who will receive the greatest reward. And the millennium is an example of that. The, the martyrs receive the biggest reward. Now, again, I don't want to be dogmatic. It could be that all the church is present for the millennial reign of Christ, and we will continue to be open to that view as we move forward. Uh, but I think the evidence is much stronger to suggest that the millennial reign is specifically for the martyrs, and the rest of the church comes to life and begins to reign with them at the end of the millennial period. Now, in all millennialism, there are basically two perspectives on how it could work. One says that you presently reign with Christ on earth through participation in the church. You don't die uh, to go into the millennial reign of Christ, but when you believe in Christ and you repent and are baptized and you begin your life in the church, it's participation in the church. That is the millennial reign of Christ. And this was Augustine's view which you can see charted below, that Satan is bound when Christ comes, the church age is established, and anyone who joins the church is now participating in the millennial reign of Christ. They're reigning with Christ. And Augustine's view is very popular uh, for a long time. Now, one of the things it suffered from was it couldn't really account for this aspect of martyrdom. If you were to ask Augustine, hey, why does the text say that the millennium is for people who have been beheaded, who have died, who refuse to accept the mark of the beast. He's going to spiritualize that. And he's going to say that, well, when you die to self, when you die to the system, when you die to the flesh, when you die to the world, uh, that's the beheading. And your new life, your reign with Christ is your participation in the church, your regeneration as a Christian believer. Now, Augustine's view has largely been replaced. Even among Catholics who think highly of Augustine, the Protestant reformers were all millennialists. They also thought highly of Augustine, but these days, uh, this view is, is not around so much. It has been overtaken. And it's been overtaken by the view of Francisco Rivera, who interpreted the thousand years to be the period between Christ's death and the coming of the Antichrist. But in contrast to Augustine, Rivera held that the millennial rule belongs to the souls of the faithful departed in heaven rather than to the church on the earth. So Augustine thought in this life, you reign with Christ in the millennium by your participation in the church. But this other view suggests that you reign with Christ when your soul leaves your body and it goes to heaven. You reign with Christ in heaven. Christ is uh, reigning at the right hand of the Father, and when you die and go to heaven, you reign with Christ. Now, of course, some people, again, are going to say that only when the martyrs die, they go reign with Christ right now. Everybody else has to wait until later on. But whether it's just the martyrs or it's all the church, uh, this view of Rivera, which is now the predominant view, you can see two other contemporary writers at the top of the screen who say that the saints will reign with Christ uh, in heaven, this has become the standard all millennial view. Uh, uh, and this is the only one we're really going to consider. I mean, Augustine's explanation that the Christians who are beheaded, that this is just a metaphor for dying to self in this life, uh, that is not convincing. Uh, if all millennialism is true, it's this idea of Rivera's and all millennialists after him. It's the idea that uh, the millennial reign of Christ will only begin for you 
after your soul leaves your body and you go reign with Christ in heaven. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, if the millennium is right now, and if it's taking place in heaven, departed Christians are in heaven right now participating in the millennium then there should be some evidence throughout the rest of the book that when Christians die and go to heaven as disembodied souls, that they are priests, uh, as this text says. Now, Williamson gives us several examples. Earlier visions in this book hinted at the priestly and royal role of the martyrs and other faithful in heaven during the church's earthly pilgrimage. The 24 elders, the heavenly representatives of the church and possibly participants in the first resurrection, worship God and the Lamb, and offer the prayers of God's people on earth. In chapter 7, those coming out of the Great Tribulation worship God and the Lamb in the temple. The word that is used for temple, naos, refers to the part of Israel's temple that only priests were allowed to enter. In a vision immediately before the seven last plagues, John sees the liturgical vision of those who had won the victory over the beast in heaven and on a sea of glass mingled with fire where they sing the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. In all of these contexts, liturgy and being in the temple and offering incense and all these things, these are things that priests do in the temple at Jerusalem. And if Christians are seen as participating in these things right now in heaven during the church age, then how can you say that the millennium is future? How can you say that, well, when the millennium arrives one day, we will be priests of the Lord? When John is seeing Christians right now in the heavenly temple who are already carrying out a priestly function, and all millennialists is going to say that this is strong evidence suggesting the millennium is right now and that you can be a priest right now in heaven with Christ. The two resurrections. Historically, all millennialism has struggled to explain the two resurrections because the first resurrection is described with the Greek word anastasis, a word which refers to physical, bodily resurrection. How can disembodied souls in heaven be considered to have undergone anastasis? So this is, this is a big deal, because if the millennium is right now, and your soul leaves your body, you go to heaven, and you reign with Christ, uh, the amillennialist says, well, that is what the first resurrection is in Revelation 20. But the problem is, resurrection means you get a new body. You get a physical body. So how can a disembodied soul in heaven be considered to have undergone resurrection? Resurrection doesn't just mean going to heaven usually. It means that you get a new physical body. And so how all millennialists are going to respond is they're going to say there are a number of passages where resurrection language is used spiritually, even if the word resurrection, anastasis, even if it usually in its normal sense indicates physical bodily resurrection, it is spiritualized in places. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So Paul here is going to talk about the life of the Christian right now in this life as being a participation in the resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive, that is, you've resurrected, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Resurrection language is being used there of Christians who have not literally received their new bodies yet. Again, in John's gospel, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. 
And so here you have a couple of passages where resurrection language is employed, uh, but it's spiritualized. And so the all millennialist will say, well, look, if, if John can do that and Paul can do that, then maybe we can consider souls in heaven reigning with Christ uh, to be a resurrection of sorts. Even though they literally didn't get a new body, and the word Anastasi seems to suggest you get a new body, uh, maybe we can spiritualize this in fact. Now, one of the reasons folks are so hard on all millennialism on this score is because this passage mentions two resurrections. And the way the all millennialists read it is that the first resurrection is spiritual, as I've said, that you die, your soul goes to heaven, you reign with Christ. That is the first resurrection. And then the second resurrection happens at the end of the millennium, that is for them at the end of the church age, and you get a physical body. And so this is why they're so criticized, because uh, they take the first resurrection to not literally be a physical resurrection. It's just a soul in heaven. But the second resurrection actually is resurrection in the normal sense. It's a physical resurrection. And so how can they change the meaning of the word resurrection uh, within the context of a single chapter? The first time, it's just a soul in heaven. And the second time, it's physical resurrection. And this is probably the point uh, for which they have been criticized more than any other. Now, the way they respond is by pointing out that there are also two deaths involved. The first death is physical and the second death is spiritual. The first death is when your physical body dies and your soul leaves, so you have uh, a physical death. But the second death is when the soul is cast into the lake of fire. It is not given a new body, but the soul is cast into the lake of fire, and that is spiritual. And so if you have one death that is physical and one death that is spiritual, it makes sense that you would have one resurrection that is spiritual and another resurrection uh, that is physical. And this is how they respond with this kind of this chiastic structure. Uh, I took a master's course on Revelation and the Baptist professor who taught this chapter, he was an all millennialist and he put this up on the board and he found this to be really convincing. Uh, I don't know how convincing this is. Uh, I don't care if you're an all millennialist or not. I'm not trying to persuade you either way, but just so you can see, this is one of the places where they get very much criticized. There are two resurrections in this chapter. They take one of them to be spiritual and one of them to be physical, and their opponents are going to accuse them of changing the meaning of the word resurrection within the context of a single chapter. Uh, whether or not they can get away with that and make that work uh, is for you to decide. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now, according to the all millennialist reading, we have arrived here at the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the church age. Gog and Magog suggest that this is the same battle as the second coming in chapter 19. And the reason we say that is because back in Revelation 19, Christ comes back on a white war horse and a sword goes out of his mouth and destroys the army of the beast. And then their bodies are given to be eaten up by the birds. Well, that is the same language that is used at the battle of Gog and Magog, as it says in Ezekiel uh, 39, uh, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, and it goes on to say, I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird. So if Gog and Magog, if language of Gog and Magog, the predatory birds, is used to describe the second coming in chapter 19, and if the battle of Gog and Magog, according to chapter 20, takes place at the end of the millennium, then that means that the second coming and the end of the millennium are the same thing. Another reason some people believe that the description of the end of the millennium here in chapter 20 is the same as the end of the church age 
uh, is because of a comparison to be made with chapter 16. In chapter 16, the second coming of Christ is about to take place. And it says that the spirits of demons went out performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Now that is at the time of the second coming. Now look at what it says in chapter 20 at what takes place at the end of the millennium. Uh, the devil will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. Uh, Sinagayin, Aftus, Is, Ton, Polemo. Now to have five words in the Greek which show up in the exact same word order, a lot of people are going to say that is not an accident. And I personally think that this is some of the strongest evidence for all millennialism, that you have the exact same phrase used of the second coming in chapter 16 is now used of the end of the millennium in Revelation 20, suggesting that the millennium is right now, the church age, and it will end with the second coming. Now the question must be asked, why is the devil released from the pit at all? According to all millennialism, this doesn't suggest Satan has been literally locked away for the duration of the millennium. It means his influence has been checked and he has been disallowed to launch the concluding battle. He is released because the gospel has accomplished everything it was intended to accomplish, and now it is time to close the church age. And so he is released so that he can launch the final rebellion. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, were also the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I pointed out earlier uh, that this phrase, the beast and the false prophet, you kind of have to uh, take it in the way that best makes sense. And a lot of this will be determined by your presuppositions. Are you a premillennialist or an amillennialist? If you're a premillennialist, uh, you're going to read it as the devil is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown a thousand years prior. Right? According to the premillennialists, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire when Jesus comes back, but the devil's only locked away in the abyss for the millennium. After Christ reigns on earth for the millennium, uh, the devil is led out of the abyss, he leads a rebellion, and then he's thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet have already been roasting for a thousand years. Now, the all-millennial perspective is different. They say the devil is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beast and the false prophet will be thrown with him at the same time. So according to all-millennialism, the beast, the false prophet, and the devil, they all get taken out at the same time, at the time of the second coming. Now, all millennialism says the battle of chapter 19 tells the story of Christ's second coming from the perspective of the two beasts' destruction. Chapter 20 retells the same story, but only by focusing on the devil's destruction. Even though the two chapters are different in many of their narrative details, this story in chapter 20 mentions all three being thrown into the lake of fire at the same time so the reader can know that both battles are transpiring at the same point in history. All millennialism has been criticized for seeing the second coming of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19 and then seeing it all over again in the very next chapter in chapter 20. And uh, the all millennialist responds by saying, look, chapter 19, we were dealing with the two beasts, right? the beast from the land and the beast from the sea. But now the, the battle has been re-narrated from a different perspective so that we can focus on the devil's demise. But even though, you know, we have two different stories, two different chapters here, uh, they're both describing the same point in history, according to the all millennialists. The premillennialists will view this differently, as we'll describe in the next video. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. All right, so this is a... Uh, uh, According to the all millennialists, this is the great judgment that takes place at the time of the second coming, right after, uh, right after Christ has defeated his enemies. Now, according to all millennialists, this description here of the great judgment sounds like the second coming. 
you look in the sec the sixth seal, which did describe the second coming of Christ, it said the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Well, if that's the description of the second coming in chapter six, well, you have the same description here at the end of the millennium. Uh, you have something similar here with the seventh bowl. This is the second coming of Christ. It said every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So you have these two other passages which are describing the second coming of Christ in language that is very similar to the end of the millennium in chapter 20. Again, suggesting for the all millennialist perspective that the millennium is right now, and when the millennium ends, that will be the second coming of Christ. Now, I think that this verse is probably the strongest piece of evidence for all millennialism, uh, in my opinion. It says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books. Well, when the seventh trumpet blows, you have the second coming of Christ. And what does it say? And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged. So if the seventh trumpet was the second coming of Christ, and the dead were being judged at that time, and you get to Revelation 20, and the dead are judged at the end of the millennium, then that means the millennium is the church age, and it will end with the second coming of Christ. This is probably... Uh, to my mind, one of the strongest pieces of evidence that they have. Do Christians go to the great white throne judgment? Now, this is a question you have to deal with, whether you're an all-millennialist, pre-millennialist, whatever. Uh, many Christians do not believe that they will be at the great white throne judgment that takes place at the end of the millennium. Uh, we want to talk about this, but first let's read the text. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their works. Now that is the phrase that's going to bother people, because this judgment is for those who will be judged according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their works. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I just want to make a quick break, a parenthesis. Uh, you might, might find it strange that it says the sea gave up the dead. And everyone is not agreed as to what this means, but I'll give you one perspective. Many pagans believe those who died while while out at sea did not make it to the realm of the dead. And some thought the souls of those who died at sea uh, were stuck there, hovering over the place in the sea where they had died. So it is possible that Revelation says the sea gave up its dead in order to refute this idea as a way of saying no matter where you die, you will be held accountable for the way you lived and you will show up at the great white throne judgment. So now let's go back to this question as to whether or not Christians go to the white throne judgment. I suggest that they do, and I think you'll find these days most Revelation scholars and specialists will suggest that the church goes to the great white throne judgment. There is a lot of evidence for this, uh, but I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. One, saying if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the fire, implies that there will be some at this judgment whose names are in the book of life, right? Why look through the book of life? to see whose names are not in it to throw them out uh, if there's no potential that anyone at this judgment could be in the book. I mean, that, that's counterintuitive. And to me, it seems to imply uh, that there will be some righteous here at this judgment. Bill says the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life, is a combination of Daniel chapter 7, where the books were opened, and Daniel 12, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued to everlasting life. So let's look at these two passages. In Daniel chapter 7, the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. 
The other Daniel passage says, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will wake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So if this phrase in Revelation about the books being open is a combination of two passages from Daniel, and if you go look at both of those passages in Daniel, it's not just the wicked. The righteous and the wicked are present at both of these judgments. Well, then it makes sense that in Revelation, both the righteous and the wicked are going to be present at this judgment to be judged according to their works. Otherwise, that means Revelation is borrowing language from Daniel, but totally disagreeing with, with Daniel's meaning, which is unlikely. And therefore, both the righteous and the wicked are present at this judgment. Third reason, Revelation has consistently stated that Christians will be judged according to our works, stated this many times. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Bless indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow them. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged each of them according to their works. That's the passage we're in now, and we'll see this again at the end of the book. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my recompense is with me, to render to every man according to his work. Now, we find this again and again in the book of Revelation. Christians are warned that they will be judged according to their works. And other places in the book emphasize uh, the grace of God. And these two are not in tension. You, you, are, you cannot earn your salvation. You are brought into the covenant on the basis of God's generous gift of salvation. But after you are saved and after you are part of the covenant, you are expected to remain within the covenant. You are expected to live out a life of faith and faithfulness. And if you come into the covenant on the basis of faith and on the basis of God's grace, and you do not use God's grace to have a transformative life, to serve Christ, if, if you spit on grace, as it were, uh, you'll be rejected on Judgment Day. Uh, your works matter a lot. Revelation was written to make sure we understand this. Okay, so I trust we have duly established that the righteous will be at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Whether you're an all-millennialist or a pre-millennialist, this is true, all right? But if you're an all-millennialist, how will the great white throne judgment work? How do you make sense of it? Well, it depends on who is presently reigning with Christ in the millennium. If it's only the martyrs of Christ presently reigning uh, in heaven with Jesus, then when the wicked die, they stay in Hades until the white throne judgment at the second coming and then they are thrown into the lake of fire. So the martyrs are presently reigning with Christ. The wicked are in Hades waiting to be thrown into the lake of fire. Well, what about the rest of the Christian dead? What about the general church that is not martyred? The non-martyred Christian dead sleep is what the text says, which can refer to a couple of different things. It could refer to suspended consciousness. If you're asleep, that you're not aware. Uh, many Christians will not go with this, but some will. Or it could refer to an existence in heaven, but not yet reigning with Christ. In other words, the martyred dead, the martyred Christians, and the non-martyred Christians, they both go to heaven. But only the martyred Christians reign with Christ right now, and the non-martyred Christians will not reign until the second resurrection uh, after the millennium, after the second coming. Right. Either one of those is what you're going to have to do here. Now, if you're Catholic, sleep will also cover purgatory and then life in heaven. Uh, and, and of course, you know, I'm not I'm not Catholic. Uh, 
the question of how purgatory fits in here is a question for Catholics to discuss with other Catholics. But nevertheless, when it says that the Christian dead will sleep until you know, the time of the great white throne judgment, uh, the non-martyred Christians, if you're Catholic, purgatory is going to fit somewhere in there. If you're not Catholic, uh, it's either suspended consciousness or an existence in heaven, but you're not reigning with Christ. As it says in Philippians 1, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so they must be in heaven, even if they're not reigning with Christ the way the martyrs are. Now, if you take the perspective that all departed Christians are presently reigning with Christ, right? Not just the martyrs, all Christians uh, who die go and reign with Christ. Or if you're Catholic, you'll say that it's all Christians who have made it through purgatory. Uh, but nevertheless, if all of the church is invited to reign with Christ in heaven right now, uh, then again, it's still the same for the wicked. When the wicked die, they stay in Hades until the great white throne judgment at the second coming, and then they are thrown into the lake of fire. But then you have this other issue. The Christian dead are already in heaven, implying God's decision about their eternal welfare has been made. So why would they go to the great white throne judgment? If right now you die, you go to heaven, you reign with Christ, I mean, the decision has already been made in your favor. You are, you're already in. So why would you go to the judgment later as though the decision hasn't been made? This is like giving someone a job and having them work for 20, 30 years and then giving them their job interview after that. It doesn't seem to make sense. So how do all millennialists who think that all Christians die and go reign in the millennium right now with Jesus, how do they deal with this? Why would they need to go to the great white throne judgment if they're already reigning with Christ? What they will say is that the physical bodies of departed Christians are still under the domain of death, Hades, and the sea. These powers and domains must give back the physical material of human bodies so it can be transformed into a resurrected body. All right, so from this point of view, as a Christian, you die your soul goes to heaven and reigns with Christ right now in the millennium. And that's where you are until the second coming. The second coming takes place. The wicked go uh, to the judgment, the great white throne judgment at the second coming. They are cast in the lake of fire. And even though you've already been with Christ, even though you've been reigning with him, you go to the judgment uh, just so that the domains of creation can give back the atoms, as it were, the physical material that made up your body so that that physical material can be transformed. You can get a new body then you will enter into eternity. And, and so this is how all millennialists who think that all of the church reigns with Christ right now, they go to the judgment, not because there's any potential that they could uh, fail at the judgment, but just so that they can get back the physical material that made up their bodies and receive new bodies uh, for eternity. And so uh, that's the all millennial perspective. Some of it is strong, some of it is weak. Uh, but next week, we will look at the premillennial perspective, the notion that the millennium is not set up until Christ comes back. A popular view with many of the church fathers uh, it went away for a long time, and now it's you know pretty popular among Protestants. So I hope that you will join me for that.